Romans chapter 6, and um, next Sunday, of course, is uh, Christmas Eve, and um, yes, we have church We have church service when Christmas is on Sunday. Why not? I mean, why wouldn't you have Chris, uh, church service when it's Christmas Day? Believe it or not, some of the... Uh, all these purpose-driven church. Rick Warren actually did this. Christmas Day fell on a Sunday. He decided that he was going to shut all four of his church campuses down. And uh, he got criticized for that, obviously. Because in people's thinking, now wait a minute. If we say we're celebrating the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, why would you shut church down on that day? Why would you do that? Didn't make sense. So he justified it by saying, oh, no, 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 this is about the gospel because now we'll have all of our church people with all of their family members and they'll all be talking about the gospel and Jesus Christ and Jesus' birthday. And I went, no, they won't. No, they won't. They're going to sit around. They're going to get presents to the kids. They're going to open presents amongst themselves. They're going to open up a case of Budweiser. And a big case of Mogan David, cheapest wine they can find, whatever, and drink and watch football. But they're not going to be talking about Jesus Christ. Amen. So, yes, we will have service next Sunday morning. Uh, we'll have both Sunday school and the regular church service. Now, Sunday afternoon, we, of course, we will be dismissing uh, that service as it will be Christmas Eve and then Christmas Day the next the next day on Monday. So, uh, and do we have any other announcements we need to make? I don't have a bulletin here in front of me this morning. All right, Romans chapter 6. Now, I've been preaching a series on um, Moses and the Israelites leaving Egypt going to the promised land. The purpose, and there's just many, many different things that uh, are, are being drawn from this picture. The idea that the Israelites were in bondage. They were literally in slavery. And, and that's back before the days of social media and cameras. And I'm telling you, those slaves, those Jewish slaves were treated with the most harshest cruelty. Uh, about the only thing that I think could be compared to it was what the Nazis did to the Jews back during World War II. May, and it may have even been worse than that. But uh, to, the, um, uh, to, the, to the Nazis, the Jews were even less than animals. Uh, if it came down to feeding a horse or a dog or feeding a Jew, those soldiers would choose to feed their dogs and their horses and starve the Jews to death. And then when they died, before they uh, cremated them and turned them into ashes, they would always pull the gold fillings out. And uh, one of our American uh, battalions happened upon a cave. And when they went inside that cave, they found a vault in there. And uh, it was full of fillings, gold fillings, out of the mouth of some Jew that they pulled out of his mouth in order to have the gold out of his mouth. Now, I'm gonna, I, probably, I probably have this in my notes, but I'm going to say something now. Uh, the war that's going on over in Israel. I want to remind you of something in case uh, you start hearing some of the propaganda about Hamas and Hamas is only reacting to uh, the Jews and how bad they've been treated and so on and so on and so on. I don't know anything about that. What I do know is that uh, the book of Romans that we have here was written by a, na a man by the name of Paul. That was his second name that he chose. The first name that was given to him at birth was Saul or Shaul. And he was a Jew. In fact, the majority of the New Testament was written by the Apostle Paul, who was 
a Jew. Does anybody know what tribe he was from? He says it in Galatians. He was a tribe of uh, Benjamin. Okay? Tribe of Benjamin. Then we have uh, John. One of my favorite authors in the Bible. He wrote the Gospel of John. He wrote the letters, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John. He wrote the book of Revelation. John was a Jew. And we have Peter. Peter didn't write any of the Gospels. He didn't write the book of Acts, but he's featured in it. He wrote the letters of 1st and 2nd Peter. And of course, Peter was a Jew. And then we have James, who was the half-brother of Jesus. He was a Jew. And then to top it all off, we have Mary Magdalene, who was a Jew. We have John the Baptist, who was a Jew. His parents, um, Elizabeth and Zechariah, they were both Jews, obviously. If John's a Jew, then Zechariah's a Jew. Mary, who gave birth to Jesus, was a Jew. And then, on top of it all, the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, when he decided to come down into this world to be born of a humble birth, he did not choose Arabia, he did not choose China, he did not choose the, uh, the tribes of uh, Central and South America or North America. He came as a son of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and then of Judah. He was of the tribe and lineage of Judah. He was of the lineage of the house of David. That means David through uh, Solomon and then so on and so on and so on. You can trace the genealogies in Matthew chapter 1 and in Luke chapter 3. And what you'll find is that the Savior of all mankind is a Jew. And to, de uh -oh, to deny that, deny it at your own risk. Jesus did not denounce his Judaism. He didn't convert to Christianity. He came to offer salvation first to the Jews. Why to the Jew first? Because he loved them. And you can't help who you love. Amen? They didn't accept it. Now we know that for the most part the Jews didn't accept it. But that was all part of God's plan because then God turns around to us non-Jews and offers salvation to us. And I'm glad he did. That because of the Jewish hard-heartedness, God then turns to a people who are nothing as far as God is concerned. And that's something you've got to remember. If you want to be anti-Semitic, remember, in God's eyes, you're nothing. You're a people who are no people. You are not the people of God. God didn't give the Gentiles the Ten Commandments. He gave them to the Jews. By the way, Moses is a Jew. Okay? All these people in the Bible, this Bible, for the most part, I ain't quite figured out Luke yet, but the rest of them, every one of them's Jews. I think Jew, I think Luke might have been a Gentile. But anyway, all of them are Jews. And so keep that in mind, and if somebody ever brings it up, mention to them, excuse me, but that's my religion you're talking about. Are you Jewish? In a way. You see, I'm a child of Abraham by adoption, by faith. The Savior who died for my sins was one of those evil Jews that you keep talking about. His name was Jesus Christ. And when you, if, when you talk bad or evil about the Jewish people, you're talking bad about my Savior. Amen? Let me hear God's people say amen. amen. Now, so I started this this series, and I've just, I'll just i tell you what, I'm getting so much out of it. And this message has been in my heart all week long. And um, we have some children that uh, need to be baptized. We're going to try to do that uh, very soon here. And uh, maybe some others, if, if you believe you're born again, never been baptized, come see me. And I'm going to read to you the same verse that I'm going to read here this morning. It's Romans chapter 6. 
So I want you to have your Bibles open there because if you've never been born again, if you've not been baptized, here's what it really is all about. And I'm using this as a segue to get into back to the story uh, in the book of Exodus and how God rescued the Israelites from Egypt and led them into the promised land. In Romans chapter 6 verse 1. The Bible says, what shall we say then? I like Paul. I think Paul was probably would have been a good lawyer. Paul was always giving a summation of the facts. He was telling you where those facts were leading. And he said, what shall we say then? Shall we? And in, verse, in Romans 5 is where the verse is that says, for where sin did it. Say this with me if you know it. For where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. Or something like that. May have got it wrong. But that's, that, that's what he's talking about in chapter 5. That as far as God and His love for you is concerned, you can never out sin God's grace. Somebody say amen to that. If you think you've been... Uh, uh, feeling guilty about maybe you, you got to thinking, well, I probably ain't going to make it to heaven because I've just done too much wrong. According to God, there is no such thing. I mean, we're hearing from Jesus who when he was asked, Lord, shall we forgive our brethren seven times? Jesus said, yea, until 70 times seven. In one day. You got to be some kind of bad dude to sin 490 sins in one day. But Jesus said, why don't I forgive them all? His mercy endureth forever, the Bible says. So what shall we say then? Now what, notice what he says. Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? No, grace is not a license for you to sin how you want to. So, and I tell you what, I know some people. I know them personally. Who have of late adopted this idea. They call it, um, well, what do they call it? Super grace or something like that. Where they believe that no matter what they do, they can go out and have affairs. They can go out and drink, get drunk. They can do whatever they want to. God's still going to save them, forgive them no matter what. They don't even have to ask. And I'm going, uh-uh, that's not what the Bible says. Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Don't you think that at some point God will have enough of your sin? But hang on. He says, God forbid, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. So that when we have somebody in the baptistry, baptized into his death. Death is laying down. And so he says in verse 4, Therefore we are buried with him. Sprinkling cannot bury somebody in water. Immersion can. The Ethiopian eunuch that believed what Philip was preaching to him, reading out of the book of Isaiah, and he said, what doth he, he said here is water, what doth hinder me to be baptized? And Philip said, if thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. He said, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. The Bible says they went down into the water. Came up out of the water. Why'd they have to go down in it if all he needed to do was splash his face? Amen. I splashed my face dozens of times. Opened up a can of soda pop. <laughs> that, doesn't, that doesn't cut it. They went down into the water and came up. Jesus, when he was baptized, went down into the Jordan River, came up. John the Baptist was in the river Jordan baptizing people. Then, so verse 4, Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Buried with him by baptism. Like as Christ was raised from the dead, we also walk in newness of life. Now, I've been using this illustration of the Israelites leaving Egypt, going to the promised land for those who have addictions. You're addicted to drugs. 
Uh, you're, even, you, you're even addicted to uh, pharmaceutical drugs. You're addicted to pornography. I'll just say you're addicted to fornication because that's what it all is. Or you're addicted to alcohol. And uh, if Roy were here this morning, he would tell you, uh, don't try to tell him that he could stop on his own because he tried it. Uh, my, our band director, Mr. Rowland, uh, he smoked up until late in life. And he always used to have a joke. He said, I, I can quit smoking. He said, quitting's easy. I said, I've done it dozens of times. That was a joke. Never mind. Was I speaking Chinese just then or what? Yeah. But anyway, um, people are under addictions and they can't stop. They think they can. They think, I'm just going to stop. Without God's help, it won't happen. And I'll say this. I'll tell you how good God is. God can even help those who will not live for him afterwards. Do you believe that? Does it not rain on the just? It does, not, does not the sun shine on lost people as much as it does saved people? Do lost people not have the food that we have? Do they not enjoy? Do not they have things that they enjoy out of life? Certainly, it rains on the just and the unjust. Whom God has delivered from some terrible sin. And yet they will not live their life for him. They refuse to do it. So this whole idea of being in Egypt. You're a slave to your sin. You can't stop. You couldn't stop if you wanted to. Just like a Jew could not choose one day to be. I don't want to be a slave anymore. That's what 21st century America sounds like. It sounds like. I don't want to be a man anymore. I want to be a woman. So I'm going to take me some hormones, put me on a wig and makeup and a dress, and alakazam, I'm a woman. Does it work that way? No. Just like you can't stop sinning. It must be from God. So we walk in newness of life. Verse 5, For if we have been planted together in the likeness of His death, we shall be also in the likeness... JR, would you help me out here? In the likeness of His resurrection. Knowing this, here it is right here. Knowing this, that our old man, that's the flesh with all the sins that we commit, all the things we do wrong. You don't even have to be addicted to something to still qualify here because you're in Egypt. You're in bondage to sin and there's nothing that's going to save you from that except the Lord Jesus Christ. Old man is crucified with him that the body of sin might be destroyed. So if I were to ask you this question, in all honesty... Those of you who may struggle with addictions or those of you who have struggled and maybe you're on the right path now, that's fine. But it's always there. It's always, it's always behind you. It's always something that every day it feels like you're just going to turn around and turn right back to that. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. You're just going to turn right back to that thing. Okay? And you don't want to. If, if, if I could say to you, there will come a time, I guarantee you, there will come a time when your sin, your addiction, or whatever it is, will no longer bring any harm to you, will no longer be chasing you down, your past will never come up again, if I could promise you that 100% guaranteed that every sin that you've ever committed can be gone and taken away just like that. How many of you would jump on that in a heartbeat? Raise your hand. Buddy, I would. I would. 
Well, guess what? The old man is crucified with him that the body of sin might be what? Destroyed that henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead, there's the key right there. He that is dead is freed from sin. Let's pray. Father, bless this message. I thank you, Lord, for those you've gathered here. I pray, dear God, that you'd preach to me first. Preach to my family. Preach to these fine people here. Preach, Lord, to all the people watching online. Preach to the good people in Kenya. Lord, just preach all over the world, if you will. This message, I pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Now, turn to Exodus chapter 14. Exodus chapter 14. Well, I get a fresh refill here. Had a good time last night, amen? Those that came to uh, our white elephant gift party. Who in here has never played that game before? Never before. You never... Wasn't it? To have something in your hand that's of value and you're going to keep it and then somebody snatch it right away from you? What did you end up with? Hey, not bad. Hey, man, she got ended up with a sign that said, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. That's pretty good. I'd take that one. All right. Exodus chapter 14. Now, I mean, I, this has been in my mind all week long. And God just kind of laid it out, uh, kind of how I, how he wanted it. So I'm going to try to do this justice. I'm going to try to preach this the way that God would have me preach it. And you just pray for me while I'm preaching this morning. So in Exodus chapter 14, uh, before we get to verse 10, which is up on the screen, I want you to look here at verse 1. The Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, that they turn and encamp before Pi-Hahiroth, between Migdal and the sea, over against Baal-Zephon, before it shall ye encamp by the sea. Remember, it's a quicker route to just go from the land of Goshen, follow the Mediterranean coast, and within just maybe a couple weeks or a month, you're there in the promised land. You're there. But that's not how God wanted it to be. If, 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 you, if you were convinced that you could live your life however you wanted to live, and then two days before you died, God would come down and save you and forgive you of all your sins, and the next two days you just live a holy life and then you go to heaven. I, I suppose that there would probably be people that, believe it or not, and I know sin. I know a sin nature. I, I recognize it when I see it because I have one. And my sin nature is almost like, man, if, if I could get this guarantee that God would save me some within days of me dying, man, I'd probably just go out and live however I wanted to live and do whatever I wanted to do and sin up and sin down and sin all around. And then I know for a fact God's going to save me two days before I die so I don't have anything to worry about. That's how some people think. That's how some people are. You offer them, I mean, I've witnessed to people, testified to them, tried to lead them down the Romans road of salvation. And they say, you know what? I know one of these days I, I'm going to get myself right, I'm going to get myself in church. I want to start following God, but I just can't do it right now. You know what they're waiting on? They're hoping... That at the end of their life, they roll the dice just right. And they can get saved just shortly before they die. But that's not normally how it happens, is it? Somebody gets witnessed to. Somebody gets talked to. Somebody that knows the gospel. And they say to themselves, you know, one of these days I'm going to get right. One of these days I'm going to get right. One of these days I'm going to get right. And one of these days they died and they had to stand before God judgment. And God said, depart from me, you work of iniquity, for I knew you not. So if that's how you were thinking it would happen, let me go back here to this, to these verses here. Speak unto the children of Israel that they turn and camp. God was going to make them go the long way. And he's saying to them. Learn how to follow me now. Because you've got a long trip before you enter into the promised land. Whenever I preach somebody's funeral and I know that they were right with God. I will try to find out when they got saved. 
Usually, it's an older person, and usually, they got saved at a young age. Sometimes, they could be, they could, they could be saved for 70 years, 60 years, 50 years. They got saved 50 years ago. Why did they get saved 50 years ago if they weren't going to die until they were like 60 or 70 years old? Because they didn't know when they were going to die. Why did you buy life insurance now? Why are you making all these premium payments on it? Why are you doing that? Because you don't know when you're going to die. That's a, that's a thing that God will not give you in advance. And now let me ask this question. If you would have been told while somebody was leading you to the Lord, showing you the scriptures, the Romans wrote of salvation, if that person would have told you, now, let me, let me throw some things in here, because before too long, after you pray this prayer, both your mama and your daddy are going to die, and you're going to have to endure the hardship of that. And then after that, you're going to get into a marriage, and that marriage is going to bust up, because you're going to find yourself in some horrible sins. Sinning everywhere, sinning against your family, sinning against God. Then you're going to have the heart of your children rebelling again. If God, in other words, if God would have told you ahead of time all of the heartache and trouble that you've experienced through life, if He would have told you that ahead of time, would you have still said, yes, I want salvation, truth? Thank you, Melissa. She's being honest. And saying, probably not. Probably not. That's why God didn't tell you the day you're going to die either. Because our nature would be, well, I'm going to sin up until maybe I die today. Maybe two days. I'll give God two days at the end of my life. And he, he's not going to accept that. So God led them literally into a trap. He puts them over by the edge of the Red Sea. The only way in and the only way out is this little roadway that they came through the mountains. And now notice in verse 10. What happened was God hardened Pharaoh's heart. God did. God, God is the one who is playing all of this out. And he hardens Pharaoh's heart. And Pharaoh says, the Israelites right over there at the Red Sea. Man, it's going to be easy picking. It's going to be fish in a barrel, boys. Load up. All, all 600 of them chariots, put me in one, put me at the lead, let's go whipping and riding, let's go kill us some Jews. And so they went down that treacherous path there through those mountains, and they got right to the edge of where the camp of Israel was, and Israel was camped right at the edge of the Red Sea. So they got the Red Sea on one side, or yeah, yeah, the Red Sea on one side and they got Pharaoh and 600 chariots and all of his horses and horsemen and spearmen and swordsmen and, and, and everything else ready to kill them some Jews. And they are going to do it. They came all this way to kill the Jews and that's exactly what they're going to do. And now the Israelites are starting to doubt God. Notice verse 10. When Pharaoh drew nigh, the children of Israel lifted up their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians marched after them, and they were sore afraid. I've been afraid of dying. I've been afraid of not living another day. Who hasn't? And the children of Israel cried unto the Lord. And they said unto Moses, notice this, they're not extolling God's glory. They are complaining against God. And so they said, Because there were no graves in Egypt, hast thou taken us away to die in the wilderness? Is that what you did? Or, or when you got to, you, you started living for God, you started coming to church, you started reading your Bible, everything was going well, and then all of a sudden, a problem hits your marriage or a problem ends up with one of your kids. Maybe, a, maybe you got a child and that child dies. I'm telling you, that's hard to get through. Trust me, that's hard to get through. Some bad things happen. And in your bitterness and in your anguish, 
You say to God, God, if I would have known this, I would have never. Or let's say that you started going to some good church and you thought, man, all these people, these people are great, man. These people are awesome, man. That's, that's, a, that's a Bible believing church, the kind of church we were looking for. And you get embedded in that church and you get close to those people and all of a sudden one of them offends you or offends one of your children. And you say, well, if I'd have known that church was that way, I'd have never gone to it. All right. So that's what they said. They said, is it because there were not graves in Egypt that you brought us out here to die? You're going to bury us out here in the Red Sea? And so they said in verse 12, is not this the word that we did tell thee in Egypt saying, let us alone that we may serve the Egyptians. Now I want to stop right there. Let's say that, oh, I don't know. Let's say that Ron and Sandy, they went to an Antifa protest with gospel tracts in their hand. Now, Antifa is not known for loving the Bible, loving Christianity, and loving the gospel. They're not known for that. And y'all get where I'm going with this? Okay. They're a hard bunch to talk to. Young, a bunch of young, entitled college students who want everything for them paid for while they lay around, fornicate, do drugs, everything like that, rebel against society, rebel against the Constitution, rebel against the laws of our land, rebel against societal norms, rebel against God, we just rebel against everything. What is the reaction do you think they would have to you trying to present to them the gospel of Jesus Christ? You went there in love. You say, I'm going to witness these people. I, I think they need to hear the gospel so they, so they can be right with God and all this stuff. So what do you think their reaction is going to be? Absolutely. Think you'd get cussed at? Absolutely you would. Okay? So look at this. Let us alone is their answer that we may serve the Egyptians you see these Antifa socialists they think that if we socialize America then everybody will be free to do whatever they want but does people who live in a socialist or communist country are they free to do whatever they want no they invited their own chains of bondage to themselves and that's just how it is they told God let us alone we will serve our sins I will sleep with who I want to sleep with I will do whatever drugs I want to do go to Portland go to Portland Oregon right now and take a walk down their downtown district and take a look at what sin has done to those people who now, because of the laws in Oregon, the police really don't arrest people for drugs. You can go and get as high as you want to on whatever you want to in broad daylight. And they think it's a heaven for them. They think this is great. But have you ever seen somebody on a street corner strung out on drugs? They're yelling at fire hydrants. They defecate in the street, in public. They fornicate in front of children. It is hell on earth. But they think they're free. They're not. And they never will be. They are the servants of sin and they'll never be anything but that for it had been better for us to serve the Egyptians than that we should die in the wilderness now so you think that God brought you all this way to kill you you think that God set you up 
to lie to you, to cheat you, and then to kill you. You thought that that's what God did. Let me, let me give you a little illustration. You remember the story in the Bible where Jesus was asleep down in the bottom of the boat? You remember that story? He's down there taking a nap. What was going on topside? A storm. A bad storm. There's nothing like being on the waves doing this. And you are scared to death. And so here the disciples are. And this is, uh, my friend Pastor Reg Kelly said, the dumbest question that anybody ever asked in the Bible. Dumbest question in the world. Matthew, carest thou not that we perish? Of course Jesus cares whether they perish or not. That's why He came. That's why He died on the cross. That's why the third day He rose from the dead. That's why He's interceding in heaven for you right now. If you, if you were to drop your eyes and start praying right now, Jesus is interceding on your behalf. So do you think He cares whether or not you perish? Sure He does. In fact, He cares more than anybody else does. In fact, he cares so much that he did something about it. But you misunderstand why God led them to the sandy beaches of the Red Sea. You misunderstand it. Look at verse 13. And Moses said unto the people, Stand still, or fear ye not, stand still. Now, standing is just doing this. It's what we're born to do. Is there any other action or performance that the, that the Israelites need to make in order to invoke God's salvation? No, they just stand. And they stand how? Still, you know what God's saying by that? It is not by the works nor the deeds of the flesh that man is saved. So now look. He said, fear ye not, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. This story is about your salvation. It is how God saved you. It is how God not only saved you, but it is how God destroyed the enemies of alcohol, drugs, fornication, adultery, witchcraft. Let me tell you, those who get involved in like magical things like witchcraft or wizardry or sorcery or necromancy or anything like that. Those who get involved in that, devils just congregate where they are and those people have the most restless sleep that anybody can have literally devils invading their dreams and scaring them out of their minds because that's what it does that's why God said don't do it God didn't say don't do it because he don't want you to have fun God said don't do it because he knows that you basically just invited, you opened the doors and let thousands of evil spirits come into your life and make a mess of your life. What does a house look like if that house has been, been invaded by a flock of pigeons? What does that house look like after a month? Ah! Amen. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord which He will show to you today. For the Egyptians whom you... Watch this now. Remember, the Egyptians are your sin. The Egyptians are, is your addiction. The Egyptians are the things that you say, the things that you lust after, the things that you dream about, the things that... The covetousness that you have, the, the pride that you have. That's what Egypt is. And God said, see, see the salvation of the Lord. He's going to show it to you today. For the Egyptians, take one last look at Pharaoh. Because after today, you're never going to see him ever again. If God could promise you that promise, would you take him up on that offer? Say amen then. Raise your hand. Shout hallelujah. Amen. God, if you offer me that, I will take you up on that. I want my sin gone. The problem with everybody else is 
They don't want their sin gone. They want to keep it. They want to hold on to it. They, they are the ones who pushed the Oregon, I guess, legislature or whatever, or what, I don't know who, I don't know how it all works, but they are the ones who pressured the powers that be to allow them to do all the drugs that they want to because they like it. And they think that they're living free, but they're not. And all you have to do is stand on the outside and look at their life from the outside and you're going, uh-uh. I don't want that kind of life. God said, I'm, you're gonna, you shall see them again no more forever. Forever, he said. The Lord shall fight for you and ye shall hold your peace. Now that phrase got my attention, the salvation of the Lord. So I went and looked it up in the Bible. Second Chronicles 20, ye shall uh, not need to fight in this battle. Set yourselves, stand ye still. There it is, God said it again. Stand ye still and see what? The salvation of the Lord. What is Israel going to have to do to, have to receive salvation? Nothing. Not a thing. Isn't that a much better plan than the one that you came up with? Well, I was told that if I do such and such a meditation, and if I get into yoga, and I was told that if I eat uh, uh, only a vegetarian or a vegan diet, and uh, that if I cut out this out of my diet and cut that out of my diet, and I do all these things to rid toxins out of my body, that I was told that if I do all these things, then I'll no longer have addictions. Believe it or not, people teach that kind of stuff. And last I checked, Addictions don't come from hamburgers. Unless your addiction is hamburgers. Okay? But stand ye still and see the salvation of the Lord. Look at Lamentations 3.26. It is good that a man should both hope and quietly, what? Wait for the salvation of the Lord. Wait for it. So if I said to you all, God will deliver you. And there will come a day when you will never, ever, ever be addicted to anything ever again. Would you be willing to wait for that day? You would if you loved your family, if you loved yourself, and you loved God enough, you'd be willing to wait for it. And something that is waited for is usually always held in honor when you receive it because of what you went through to get it. And then that led me to Romans 8. For we are saved by what? Hope. You know what some of you have, you know what's happened to some of you? You've given up hope. You've said, there is no hope for me. I'm never going to be cured of this. I can't, I can't imagine the feeling of not wanting to get drunk, not wanting to get high, not wanting to get a buzz from some whore or some whoremonger. Fornication brings a high in and of itself. It's a different one, but it's a high nonetheless. And that's why people chase it down over and over and over again. For we are saved by hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. So that's why God didn't tell you when he told you to go to camp out by the Red Sea. That's why God didn't tell you why he wants you to camp out by the Red Sea. Because then it's hope that you can see. Then you don't need any hope. You won't live in hope. And you won't need to trust God. If God already said, this is what I'm going to do. This is how I'm going to do it. This is the day I'm going to do it on. And I promise you, you won't miss it. There's no hope in that. You just already got it. You, you already know it's going to happen. You just wait for the day to show up. You do whatever you want to in the meantime. And it doesn't require faith, nor trust in God, nor hope. But then God doesn't tell you what day it's going to happen on. God doesn't tell you what direction it's going to come from. God doesn't tell you how it's going to happen. He just tells you to do this and trust Him. 
And if you trust him, I have found that God will always come through for those who have hope. Somebody say amen. He said, for what a man seeth, why doth he yet hope for? But if we hope for that we see not, then do we with patience wait for it. God told Israel, Moses, take them down to the sands of the Red Sea and wait to see the salvation of the Lord. And I promise you, it'll come. Now, God did not tell them what he was going to. He didn't tell them he was going to open up the Red Sea. He didn't tell them anything. He didn't tell them that he was going to have Pharaoh chase them in there and then have him killed. He did not tell them his plan. He just told them, do you trust me? Do you trust me? And I'm glad that at all the right times in my life, I did. I trusted him. And boy, what a deliverance. Second Timothy 1, Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me as prisoner, but be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God who have saved us and called us with an holy calling, not according to our works, because standing still is not a work. Waiting is not a work. Having faith is not a work. Having hope is not a work. Not according to our works, but according to His own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. In other words, God had a plan already set up before the world was even made. He had a plan already set up. God was going to deliver you. God was going to save you. And in the process of it, he was going to use you as bait to kill your enemies. Because God knew that dangling 600,000 Jews in front of Pharaoh and saying, boy, wouldn't it be nice to see their blood everywhere? Pharaoh, that was something he just couldn't turn down. Okay? Okay. It's like going up to somebody who's like into the fourth day of trying to quit smoking and you hand them a cigarette and light it up for them. They just can't pass that up. Amen. Come on, you can say amen to that. Uh-huh. 1 John 3, 8. He that committeth sin is of the devil. Now watch this. For the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose. Look at that word purpose. I underlined that word according to his own purpose. Here, for this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of who? The devil. Pharaoh and the Egyptians are the devil. And God is going to destroy them. How is he going to do it? He's going to use you to do it. He's going to let them abide in your flesh to where you have sins in your life. And now, how did Jesus, how does the Bible say that Jesus destroyed our enemies? Did he say abracadabra? Did he uh, take a, a chicken leg and put it in a pot with some tea and, and mix it all up and then look to see what kind of odor came out of that? And that determined, did he look to the stars or whatever? How did Jesus do it? With his death, he destroyed death. So that's what baptism is all about, isn't it? It's about us dying to the old world and coming back to life again. And that's how he's going to destroy the works of the devil. So back to Exodus 14. Verse 15, the Lord said unto Moses, Wherefore Christ thou unto me, speak unto the children of Israel, that they go forward and lift up thy rod and stretch out thine hand over the sea and divide it. And the children of Israel shall go on dry ground through the midst of the sea. And I will behold, and I behold, I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians and they shall follow them. And I will get me honor upon Pharaoh and upon all his hosts and upon his chariots and upon his horsemen. How many? One, two, three, four. It's a number for the gospel. The number for principalities and powers and rulers of darkness and spiritual wickedness. This is how God's going to destroy them. And the Egyptians shall know that I... Now, notice this. Notice that God did not say to Moses, Moses... Give everybody of the camp of Israel a sword in their hand. Because Pharaoh's coming and I want you to try to, with all your might, to fight against Pharaoh and his chariots and his armor and his shields. 
Was that a good plan? No. God did not put it into our hands to defeat our enemies. We can't. They're too big for us. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I have gotten me honor upon Pharaoh, upon his chariots and upon his horsemen. So now in verse, four, uh, verse 19, the angel of God which went before the camp of Israel removed and went behind them. This is Christ, by the way. And the pillar of cloud went before their face and stood behind them. And it came between the camp of the Egyptians and the camp of Israel. Already God is holding back Pharaoh so he doesn't hurt you. Already he's doing that. And God says to you this morning, today, right now, he says to you, fear not, child, for I am with thee. My rod and my staff, they'll comfort you. I'll prepare a table for you in the presence of your enemies. I'll do these things for you because I love you. Don't fear the Egyptians. Because as strong and as mighty as they are, I am more powerful. And I am stronger. And I am more mighty. And all it will take is for me to release the waters. And it's over with. I mean, how much power would it take to divide the entire Red Sea from Beach to beach on the other side. How much power would that take? Uh, that's, that's, un, that's unreal. So that's what God said. Uh, so verse 21. Moses stretched out his hand over the sea and the Lord caused the sea to go back by a strong east wind all that night and made the sea dry land and the waters were divided. And the children of Israel went into the midst of the sea upon the dry ground and the waters were a wall unto them on their right hand and on their left. I mean, that's something that's just never been seen before on the earth and it's not been seen since except for when they crossed Jericho. Did you know? Take a look up here on the screen. Did you know that Benjamin Franklin's idea for the very first great seal of the United States was, and he wrote it out, Moses, over the Red Sea, extending out his hands with the glory of God in a cloud and Pharaoh wearing a crown, and his chariots and his horsemen and all the Egyptians drowning in the Red Sea. That was what was going to be. That's what Benjamin Franklin said we ought to put as our great seal of the United States of America. You don't, you don't hear that in school taught anymore, do you? They don't want you to know that, that our nation was founded by men who believed in God. Amen. Can you imagine the fit that liberals and leftists and socialists and commies and everybody else, Antifa, would have over such a religious message as this? I, I would just be laughing every day. <laughs> Look at me. That's our great seal. Look at that. <laughs> that's Moses there and that's Pharaoh there. 2 Corinthians 5, for we walk by faith, not by sight. So do you trust God? Do you trust God? Because God's not going to let you see it. He's just going to write it down and let you believe it. And if you'll believe it, God will do the rest. Amen? Now the just shall live by faith. That's how we live. That's how... Our addictions get taken away. That's how we handle times when we fall back. That's how we deal with those days that we would give anything for a drink or give anything for a drug or give anything to be pleasured. God says the just shall live by faith, but if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. God already knows who's going to draw away and who's not. I can imagine that there was probably still some people in the camp of Israel that said, I don't care what God said, I'm not going in that. I don't know that the Bible doesn't say that, so I don't say that. But 
I can just imagine some old Jew going, uh-uh, you're not getting me in there. I ain't doing that. God will, God will pull the trigger and all that water come down on us. Or Pharaoh will get us. Well, God held Pharaoh back until he knew the children of Israel were in safety, and then he released the waters. So verse 26, And the Lord said unto Moses, Stretch out thine hand over the sea, that the waters may come again upon the Egyptians, upon their chariots, upon their horsemen. And Moses stretched forth his hand over the sea, and over the... Um, and upon the, he stretched forth his hand over the sea, and the sea returned to his strength when the morning appeared. And the Egyptians fled against it, and the Lord overthrew the Egyptians in the midst of the sea. And the waters returned and covered the chariots and the horsemen, and all the host of Pharaoh that came into the sea after them. There remained not so much as one of them. Every single one of them were killed. Every one of them. So that the Israelites never have to worry about the Egyptians ever again. If I were to tell you this morning that God will. I'm not saying God might. I'm saying God will. I promise you God will remove every enemy in your life against whom you fight every day. If I were to promise you that. Would you take God's hand and say, God, I trust you. I trust you. Would you do that? Um, in verse 30, thus the Lord saved Israel that day. See, this is a salvation message. Thus the Lord saved Israel that day out of the hand of the Egyptians. And Israel saw the Egyptians dead upon the seashore. And Israel saw that great work which the Lord did upon the Egyptians and the people feared the Lord and believed the Lord and his servant Moses. And that's what it was all about. But God didn't tell you his plan. He didn't have to. He just tells you the next step to make and you make it. And then he tells you the next step after that and you make it. And you do it in faith because you trusted him. I'm going to tell a little story and I'm going to, I'm going to close out. And I want you to be thinking now of what you're going to do today. Um, a couple of years ago, when we first started going to the MUFON symposiums, a man um, came and met me there. He was a follower of our ministry. And um, he just had been following me for years. And he introduced himself. And I, I, I kind of got to know him a little bit. And... Um, he just said, I just, he said, I, I work for a living. I do this and this. He said, but I took days off just so I could be here with you while you're at this symposium. And he said, I'm here to, if you need me for anything, I'll do anything you ask me to do. He said, you don't know what, how God has worked through you to bless my life and bring me out of the horrible bondage and so on. And I, I said, sure, you know, that's great. And I, you know, I didn't know him. I never, I don't think I ever talked to him before, but anyway, uh, something come up and I needed to record. Well, the camera that I brought didn't work. And I needed a video camera. And I thought about it for a while and I thought, well, I can't leave. So I took this man aside and I said, I'm fixing to give you a thousand dollars. And I said, I need a video camera. And I wrote down exactly what I was looking for. And I said, now, I'm going to trust you. You got $1,000 of my money. You don't have to come back if you don't want. Because I don't know where you live. Don't, I don't know anything about him. I didn't even check his driver's license and see what his real name was. But I said, you can take this money and do whatever you want to with it. And there ain't a thing I can do about it. But I said, here's the camera that I need. Will you go get it for me? He said, I'd love to. And he left. He came back a few hours later. But he came back. He handed me this box. And inside, I looked it over. It was exactly what I needed. I still have the camera. I decided to have a little bit of confidence in this man that he wouldn't do me wrong. And he didn't. 
There's still some good people out there. You be one of them. You be one of them. But if I'm willing to accept this man's help, with my, it was my own personal money, if I'm willing to accept this man's help on this little thing, why wouldn't I accept God's help on the most important issue in my life? And I'm going to ask you to bow your head this morning. I don't know where everybody in this room stands as far as are you saved or are you lost. But I'm going to ask you this morning that in, in just, just a few minutes here, just a minute, I'm going to ask you that if you're lost, or let's say that you're under the bondage of some addiction, and you would like to finally put your trust in God to deliver you. By the way, that promise I made about delivering you, it may be at your death, but that's okay. Because God will give you grace no matter what. But if you'd like to just come step down here, one of these benches, I'll pray with you. I'll show you from the scriptures. And I'll pray with you. And you can accept God's offer if you trust him. So the question I'm asking you is, do you trust God? With the most important thing in your life, do you trust God? I'm going to wait a minute. Savior, Savior, hear my humble cry, while on others thou art calling, do not pass me by. Father, I come before you today, and God, I thank you for this message. Lord, it it mean a lot to me. And God, had, had I known, had truly, had I known the path that you were going to bring me on in my life, I'm not certain that I would have, that I would have followed you. I'm not certain that I would. And I think you knew that, and so you decided not to show me and the things that I've learned from you and about you, I've learned the hard way. My own mistakes, my own arrogance, my own pride, my own stupidity brought me to a place where I literally had nothing. But Lord, I decided then that I had to trust you because that's all I had left was you. And Father, I pray, dear God, that you would speak to each and every heart listening to me today. And God, Lord, that you would work in their heart and in their mind this one idea, God, that they can trust you. They can take the things, Lord, that they are in bondage to and stand and watch the salvation of the Lord and watch how it is that you are going to save them and you are going to forgive them and you're going to deliver them so that on that day, take one look because they are never, ever going to see the Egyptians ever again. What a day that will be when we don't have to face our enemies and our past ever again. 
But Father, I pray, dear God, that you would bless each and every one. That you would open up their eyes to the sin that is real in their life. And teach them that they can trust you. In fact, you're all that they have left. And that you will bring them to a day when they will see Egypt never again. Father, we thank you for the good words that you spoke to us today. We thank you, Lord, for the blessing of our children this morning. We ask you, Lord, to dismiss us now in your care. We pray in Jesus' name and all God's people said. Amen. Hey, God bless you. You are dismissed this morning.